Hello everyone! Welcome to Old News! My name is Laura Beth Spear. I am the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences Outreach Specialist and I'll be your host for today's webcast. Um, so I will be checking our live chat so that if you have any questions you can type those into the chat room and I'll keep an eye on them make sure we answer them during this podcast. I have with me Dr. Christian Kammerer, the museum's research curator of paleontology, and we're going to bring you some discoveries from the field of paleontology. So you may be wondering uh, why I'm wearing this coat that's keeping me very nice and warm. Christian, what's new? Uh, well, uh, thanks for the introduction, Laura Beth. <laughs> um, it's the coldest time of the year, at least here in the northern hemisphere, uh, so I thought it would be interesting if we talked about some polar animals past and present, um, and in particular, uh, a group that you're probably pretty familiar with, the penguins. Um, they're adorable little birds that live in the southern oceans, mm -hmm. and so when you think penguins, like what part of the world immediately comes to mind? Um, I definitely imagine penguins sliding down a very icy area of the world, so like Antarctica is usually what I imagine. Yeah, so penguins, they do live all throughout the southern ocean, so you've got them in Patagonia, New Zealand, and South Africa, um, but they're best known as one of the major sort of faunal components of Antarctica. Um, and that is true today, and that has been true uh, basically throughout penguin evolution. Uh, we believe penguins have been living on the Antarctic landmass. Um, but uh, it, for paleontologists, Antarctica is a very challenging place to work. Uh, most of the land, at least currently, is covered in ice. And so if we look, bring up a map of Antarctica here, you can see everything there in white is ice coverage. Uh, so there's very little exposed rock for paleontologists to look for fossils in. Mm -hmm. um, now one of the rare exceptions to that is in the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, which is the, it's a long narrow part of the continent that extends out of the Antarctic Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and it is here on Seymour Island, which you can see uh, is part of uh, the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, that is uh, actually a very well-known island for finding both Cretaceous and tertiary fossils, including penguin fossils. Uh, so if we look at this highlight of Seymour Island here, um, Seymour Island, the different colors just indicate what age the rocks are there. So in the lower left, that little bit of green, that's Cretaceous, and people have found Antarctic dinosaurs and various marine reptiles there. Mm -hmm. um, but in the yellow up in the top right there is in the, the so-called age of mammals in the tertiary. Um, and it's particularly in the Eocene epoch, which is around 50 million years ago. So mm -hmm. after, after non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, but pretty soon after that. Uh, it's when the modern groups of mammals and birds are really just starting to diversify. Um, and so this area has yielded a lot of penguin fossils since the early 1900s um, and continues to produce. And the, mo the latest penguin fossil that was found there, which was described just this month, is maybe the most spectacular yet, in a sense. Um, so let's take a look at this new fossil. Uh, at first, it may not seem especially uh, incredible. It looks kind of like a copper light to me, Christian. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, You've shown can... us poop? Uh, no, so this is, it's a fossilized wing of okay. an extinct type of penguin called Paleudiptes. Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort of see that it looks kind of like a chicken wing. So you've got the, the bone in the top right, that a blackened bone there, that's the humerus. And then the rest of it is the, you know, radius ulna and then the tip of the wing. Um, mm -hmm. But what's really interesting about this specimen is that it has actual fossilized skin on it. So very rare in general to get uh, fossil skin, um, and for birds, you know, almost never. So this is the first of its kind mm -hmm. for fossil penguins. Right, because we found um, like imprints of skin, right? Yeah. Or imprints of feathers, maybe. Well, so there are a lot of feathers that are preserved uh, either intact or as impression fossils, mm -hmm. um, but generally not the underlying skin. So okay. the feathers, you know, they're keratinous. It's a little bit more resistant. To fossilization. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of dinosaur preservation, there's lots of dinosaurs that have been preserved with this skin. Um, but when you think of a non avian dinosaur that may have, you know, centimeters thick skin and big rhomboidal mm -hmm. scales, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot more resistant to decay and gives it more time to fossilize mm -hmm. than a modern bird. 
if you think of like songbirds, their skin is paper thin. Even like the larger birds that would e experience day to day, something like a chicken. Mm -hmm. I mean, chicken skin you can We're, think is probably not going to preserve. A lot of us are probably very familiar well familiar with the yeah fried chicken skin. Yeah. Hmm. Fried fossils. Well, they would they would actually preserve better if they were fried because at least that gives a little <laughs> resistant layer there. That would um, make them harden. Yeah. Make them okay. Okay. Uh, as it is though with frying technology, not <laughs> invented until recently, there's very little opportunity for bird skin to be fossilized. Right. So it's really cool that we actually found this in a fossil penguin. Right. Yeah. That's and, awesome. And it's in this animal, uh, Paleudiptes. So the name is a it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it refers to this uh, other type of penguin called Eudiptes. So if you look at the the picture here, Eudiptes is just all the crested penguins. So like that's the mm -hmm. macaroni penguin there. Mm -hmm. um, very common uh, group of penguins uh, living around Antarctica and you know some other places in the Southern Ocean. Um, so the name just means old Eudiptes. Eudiptes mm -hmm. itself is Greek. It means good diver because these birds are extremely good at diving. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're aquatic birds. Very um, creative name. So yeah, it's pretty <laughs> boring. Uh, the reason for that is because it was actually the first fossil penguin ever found. Like not this wing, but the genus in general. Okay. Um, so, but the first specimen was actually very poor. So we can look at this picture here. This is the old lithograph of this first fossil. Uh, described by Thomas Huxley in the 1850s, and this is just a fragment of an ankle bone. Oh, wow. um, and at the time, he thought it looked most like Eudiptes, so mm -hmm. he said it was the old Eudiptes. So he was comparing that to the modern ankle bones of um, modern Eudiptes penguins, right? Yes. Okay. And so these penguins actually have, they have very specialized ankle bones that make it very easy to recognize as fossils. Um, so penguins actually have a really good fossil record by bird standards. So most birds have uh, hollow bones. So like if you look at a, you know, look at a bird bone here, uh, you can see that it's it's hollow in, in the middle. And so that mm -hmm. for flying birds, that's really useful. Um, to some... yeah, so they're when they're flying around, they're not weighed down just by the the weight of the skeleton. Right. Um, so it really saves energetically mm -hmm. uh, during flight. However, when you're underwater, you want to have very robust bones. Um, because then you're not sort of struggling against gravity to stay aloft. Mm -hmm. Rather, you're fighting against uh, buoyancy from, you know, inside your lungs, inside the body, uh, and you want to be able to swim down deeper. So a lot of right. marine animals, especially things like, you know, dolphins, manatees, uh, they have very dense bone, what we call osteosclerotic bone, which means uh, it's basically just bone all the way through. It's not mm -hmm. a marrow cavity. It's not hollows there. Okay. Um, and penguins have some of that. So even prehistoric penguins would not have had the hollow bones, right? They had yes. the osteosclerotic yeah. bones. Yeah. So the okay. the earliest so fossil shipping. penguins, uh, they are not that aren't fully adapted to aquatic life would have been in an intermediate state. Okay. But even by the uh, time of like the Eocene, you're getting dense bones in penguins. Mm -hmm. So uh, they were never flying in the sky like some of our birds. Well, I mean, they're, they're from flighted ancestors, so mm -hmm. they are secondarily flightless, mm -hmm. but they would have been flightless since basically the beginning of the Cenozoic. Mm -hmm. So we think the divergence of penguins is pretty close to dinosaurian extinction, because you get the first ones in the Paleocene very okay. soon afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but this ankle bone, it's one of these you know heavily uh, ossified sclerotic bones, mm -hmm. and so those are the ones that are most commonly preserved in fossil penguins. So if you look at Here's a diagram showing the outline of a, a very similar type of fossil penguin to Paleodiptes. This one's called Perudiptes. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows you just the, the bones that you, you will usually find uh, in a fossil penguin. So things like the jaw, um, the main arm bone here, the humerus, uh, which is, you know, it's, that's the same bone in our arm. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the femurs, the main bone in our legs. Um, but then they have this bone called the tarsometatarsus, which we don't have. It's a bone unique to birds, really, uh, but it's caused by the fusion of a bunch of the ankle and foot bones. Mm -hmm. um, and in a complete tarsometatarsus, uh, it looks like this, is in another penguin specimen, also Paleudiptes. Uh, you can see that it has these three sort of prongs at the bottom. Those are the, the condyles, and that's where the three main weight-bearing toes of a penguin attach. Mm. Uh, so this shape, you know, it's this very sort of squat, Robust mm -hmm. size, very characteristic for penguins. And their toes look really, um, really wide, and yeah. like almost like if I touch them, they'd be really squishy. Is there, 
is it like do they have a lot of fat around their toes? Yeah, so penguin toes they are very thickened, um, and they you know they're stepping on some of the coldest land in the world, right? Uh, yeah, and they <laughs> need to try to you know retain heat as best as possible. Mm -hmm. um, like if we walked around barefoot, we would get frostbite very Pretty rapidly. Quickly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but penguins are adapted to survive that, so they have thickened scales, they do have some fat in the feet. Uh, yeah. They also tend, when they're at rest, to like put their body down and put the downy feathers on the underside around the feet to protect them. Okay. Um, but the rest of the time, you know, they have to be waddling around on the surface, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, they get very cold indeed. Um, so initially, uh, we only had fragments like this of fossil penguins mm -hmm. in paleontology. Um, but in more recent years, uh, there have been a lot of really exciting fossil discoveries involving extinct penguins that give us a much better idea of what these animals looked like mm -hmm. and show that actually they weren't especially similar to things like the modern Eudipedes and other penguins. Okay, so how are they different? Well, I mean, if we can look at a few of these fossils here. Um, so these, this is comparing two skulls, one of a living penguin and one of a very close relative of Paleoeudipedes called Ecodiptes. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing you'll notice is that the beak is much, much longer. Mm -hmm. um, it's also narrower. So these extinct penguins have been nicknamed spear billed penguins uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that this, it's a much larger animal in general than living penguins. It's not just that the beak is longer, the animal as a whole would have been much bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you know what the, the biggest living penguin is? Um. I think it's an emperor penguin. Yeah, that's correct. Hence the name, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, Aptenodides <laughs> forsteri, the emperor penguin. Okay. So, if we look there. And uh, how big are emperor penguins, though? I don't know that. They max out at four feet tall, so 1.2 meters. Awesome. Um, so, I am still taller than you're, you're taller an than emperor penguin. You are taller than the biggest living penguin. Uh, I'm myself. However, uh, these spear billed penguins, uh, so if we look at Icodiptes here and its relatives, I mean, they could have gotten. You know, pretty confidently estimated at you know 1.5 meters tall. So these are things that are pushing six feet. Uh, the biggest one, which is actually a specimen of Paleoeudipedes, has been estimated at a full two meters tall. So that's six and oh, a half wow. feet tall. So that's taller than you. Penguins that are even taller than me, uh, which is a pretty frightening concept <laughs> uh, when you think about these things. Yeah, I don't, especially with the long. Yeah, the giant spear. spear beak that's like you know the length of your arm. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been formidable. Predators. Yeah, uh, and they were predators, right? Yeah, so Sorry they, to we throw think. Us off topic, no, no. Uh, as all living penguins, you know, eat primarily fish and crustaceans, and okay. that would have been true for the their fossil representatives mm -hmm. as well. Cool. So how else are they different? They've got the longer skull, bigger bodies. Did we, you know, did we, did we learn any yeah. other differences? So Some if you more? look at here's a nearly complete skeleton of a extinct spearbill penguin called Inca Yaku. Um, so this is, the name means, it's from the Quechua language, uh, native Peruvian language, and it means water king, uh, uh. which is maybe more evocative than old Eudipedes. So <laughs> right. penguin researchers are getting progressively better at naming these things. Yeah. Um, but in addition to having, you know, the morphological features I was just talking about, the fact that it was found in Peru is really interesting, because in the west coast of South America, there generally aren't penguins today. So there are a few penguins, uh, well, there's a species, the Galapagos penguin, that lives on the equator in the Galapagos Islands oh, wow. off of Ecuador, um, but that's sort of an, an exception to living penguin diversity. For mm -hmm. the most part, they really are down in the southern ocean. Um, Didn't even know that. But Inkiyaku and Peridiptes and Ikadiptes, and actually a whole variety of penguins showed that they were quite widely distributed throughout coasts, basically across the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, for something like 20 million years in the tertiary. Oh. So living penguin uh, geographic range has contracted quite a bit mm -hmm. since, uh, you know, since the Eocene. And um, can you help me imagine what the land mass would have looked like at this time, about 15 yeah. million years so ago? Yeah, so it is after, no, it's after Pangaea. So okay. Pangaea split up into its components initially, Laurasia in the north and Gondwana in the south, um, mm -hmm. earlier on in the Mesozoic. And by the time you're in the uh, tertiary, you are getting basically all the modern continents. Okay. Um, but some of them are not quite as we know them today. Mm -hmm. So for example, South America at that time was an island continent just sort of floating out in between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So it didn't connect with North America until millions of years later. Mm -hmm. um, pretty recently, actually, in 
grand scheme of things. Um, so in South America at that time, you did get yeah, <laughs> you get a very uh, unique fauna, and there are all these extinct South American groups that mm. basically were wiped out when it collided with North America. Oh. Um, but penguins, happily, you know, they're still around today. Um, another interesting thing about Inca Yaku is was we have uh, feathers for it. So the paleontologists who originally found it uh, discovered feather uh, feathers preserve not just the impressions but the actual fossilized feathers. Oh wow! Um, and through this, they were actually able to figure out uh, using the melanosomes, which we talked about in an earlier right, like uh, pig pigment cells. Yeah, right? so pigment cells, pigment cells figure out what color this uh, giant penguin's feathers were, and it turns out that it's sort of a, a brownish reddish color. So it's actually okay. coincidental. It's that's not the actual fossilized yeah, color there. Yeah, in the in the picture that looks like maroon, right? Yeah. Like a reddish brown. It would have been but that's just pretty similar to that in life okay. as well. Okay. And I so how did they how did the feathers fossilize? Were the, was it in ice? No, so this is not in it's not cold at this time. So in the Eocene actually the world is quite warm in general. So you have what's mm -hmm. called the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, which is when global temperatures peak basically during the Cenozoic. Okay. Um, and then the world was cooling since then. Now we're forcing global warming, global warming again. again through human activity, but yeah. it's uh, at the time it, that was natural uh, global warming. Hmm. Um, and so the, in South America it was quite warm. Even in Antarctica where these penguins were living it was a lot warmer than it was today. So Paleodiptes and the other penguins that lived on Seymour Island, you know, that would have been you know, not quite tropical, but you know, sort of Reasonable temperate, even though it was near the Antarctic Circle, even mm -hmm. at that time. Right. So yeah, it would not have been glaciers or anything covering it at the time. So, um, were there any differences between you know, the penguins alive at that time and the penguins alive now because of the different climate? Yeah, absolutely, and that's actually something that this uh, new Paleodiptes wing uh, helps us understand. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that you can see on the wing is uh, the scientists who are researching it. Uh, they did scanning electron micrographs, so basically, you know, high precision microscope photography mm -hmm. of the skin surface. And even though the feathers aren't preserved, they could tell how basically the, the little follicles where the, the feather, the quills attach oh, to the right. body. Oh, right, like we have for the, you know, the hair on our arm or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, and so they can count the number of feathers that would have been present on the wing. And mm -hmm. so these extinct penguins, we know they had less. They had fewer feathers, they had less densely arranged feathers on the wing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few things that that tells us actually. So one, uh, modern penguins, uh, the, the wings are actually highly adapted towards underwater flight. That's the, the way penguins swim. And so they're basically flying underwater. Oh. Um, they hold the body very tight together and then they use the wings. You know, uh -huh. basically it's the wings. same stroke as, well, they yeah. are wings, but they're both oh, wings right. and flippers. Oh. <laughs> um, and so the, the feathers, the primary feathers on a penguin wing are incredibly sort of, they're almost scale-like, they're very rigid. Hmm. So if you look at a like modern bird, like here's a, an owl wing, mm -hmm. um, the primary feathers, the flight feathers on the wing, they are, they're rigid uh, basically to you know, provide that lift when the animal is flying. Right, um, and you mentioned downy feathers earlier, so those are not these no, stiff so, so feathers. No, the, so the downy feathers, they're on the body, and they're much, you know, they're softer, they're fluffier, uh, right. they help to retain heat on the body, so penguins okay. also very much need to retain heat Speaking in of the Arctic. Speaking of retaining heat, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too, too much, in too much for in the here. bit. <laughs> they go up the bit. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah, so these, uh, the feathers on the wing on penguins are almost like they're slaty, uh, but they're very densely packed and they're very rigid mm -hmm. um, because they have to provide lift through water, which is much denser than the air. Right. So they have yeah. to be a lot more resistant, even than you know a powerful flying bird like an owl here. Yeah. Um, so in part, the greater number of feathers uh, on modern penguin wings relative to things like Paleoeudiptes mm -hmm. is you know, just becoming better adapted towards underwater locomotion. Mm -hmm. um, but it is also, like, we don't have uh, the body feathers preserved for Paleodiptes and these, some of these other fossil penguins. Mm -hmm. um, but modern penguins have very dense sort of downy feathers as well, so they're probably they packing in warm. more feathers to keep them warmer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that probably is a, an adaptation as the world did get colder and Antarctica got extremely cold. 
for penguins to survive there. They were formerly living in warmer temperatures. Mm -hmm. It got very cold, but they managed to adapt and survive. Mm -hmm. um, and so the modern penguins, you know, they're quite specialized compared to, in their own way, compared to these, you know, seemingly weird giant spear-billed penguins. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing of interest is if we look at the, the evolutionary tree, basically, of penguins, look at penguin history. So all the living penguins are up here in the corner in orange. Mm -hmm. And then these giant spear-billed penguins are in blue here. So they're not an evolutionary dead end. They actually are the ancestors of modern penguins. So all living penguins are descended from this group of giant spear-billed penguins. Oh. And then they shrank over time. So that makes this um, any fossil find, you know, related to paleo Eudictes, even more important, in my opinion, right? If it's mm -hmm. a direct ancestor, because it tells us a lot more about, like, the modern... Penguins. Yeah, it's so helping us understand where modern penguins came from. Right. Um, wow. Well, I have hopefully a quick question, but okay. we have a lot of great questions. You guys have a lot of great questions that we will get to. Um, I'm just curious, you know, okay, so the Paleo Eudiptes, it had, you know, fewer feathers, mm -hmm. presumably to be better at underwater flight, which I love, and then also to be, um, to be adapted to a warmer environment. Yeah. So the penguins today, you know, over millions and millions of years, they've evolved to be adapted to a colder climate. But as our climate is warming up, do we, how do you think, do you think the populations of penguins are going to be in trouble? Like, do you think they can kind of move backwards to adapt to that warming climate? Well, and I, this th might be a I think penguins could adapt to warming climates, um, but it's a question of rate. It's a question of how fast that change is occurring. Okay. So we know that in the past that penguins lived in warm water and now they've adapted to colder waters, mm -hmm. but that's over millions of years. So we're looking at changes in global climate on you know, decades right. that are greater than right. have happened in millions that's of years sure. time. Mm -hmm. um, and so especially like, you know, penguins aren't also, they're not isolated in their ecosystem. So individual mm -hmm. penguin species, if that's mm -hmm. all there were, could probably deal with warmer waters. I mean, as I right. mentioned earlier, there is a penguin that lives at the equator, the Galapagos penguin. Yeah, yeah. So they so can survive there. They'll be okay, but, presumably. Well, well, there's some El Nino things going okay, on in the Galapagos sure. that are very <laughs> concerning as well. But yeah. anyway, um, but the habitat these penguins are living in, so when the ice sheets are gone, they're losing their rookeries. They're very reliant on these huge burst populations of mm -hmm. fish and squid in the Circumantarctic current. So right. once you get that breaking down uh, mm -hmm. with increased temperatures, they might be losing their food sources. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it could be pretty grim for penguins uh, if, you know, glacial melt rates continue as they are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I would love to dive even deeper into that topic, but let's get to some of these awesome questions. Right. Um, okay, drops of love. Thank you for joining us again. They want to know, would a creature like Archaeopteryx be a bird or a dinosaur? Sure. And I guess... Yeah. So it's, it's both. So Archaeopteryx is arguably the best known fossil bird. Um, I, I, yeah, I think we can say it is, it is a bird. A uh, bird is, doesn't, it's not a scientific term. Uh, it is, right. it's you know, just the English word for flying thing with feathers. Right, yeah. Um, Archaeopteryx is one of the earliest uh, members of the, the bird lineage, which is either called Aves or mm -hmm. Aviale, depending on what scientist mm -hmm. you speak of. Um, but the thing about Archaeopteryx is it is also a dinosaur. So it is mm -hmm. descended from dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are the ancestors of birds. Mm -hmm. um, all birds are, in a sense, dinosaurs because dinosaur is a formal scientific term. Di the group Dinosauria, uh, by definition, contains all of its descendants, which are all the birds. Mm -hmm. um, so generally, we differentiate non avian dinosaurs, which are things that people usually think of, like Triceratops. T-Rex, Stegosaurus, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, mm -hmm. from avian dinosaurs, which are, are the birds. But Archaeopteryx, it's even, it's a difficult case because in fossils, like, no one ever saw them alive, so we don't usually have common names for them. Mm -hmm. Like, at what point do you say, that, okay, it stopped being a dinosaur, it started being a bird? Can't, right. can't really answer that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's both dinosaur and bird. But, and um, Archaeopteryx, was that a an important link between modern dinosaurs yes. slash birds and, you know, prehistoric dinosaurs. Yeah, so Archaeopteryx is actually one of the, the most important sort of uh, macroevolutionary uh, pieces of evidence. Mm -hmm. So it was discovered in Germany uh, almost right after Darwin's The Origins of Species was published. Oh, and wow. seeing 
in like a spectacular complete fossil that was a clearly a bird because it had wings and feathers mm -hmm. um, but also had teeth like a reptile and sort of a long scaly tail like a reptile mm -hmm. um, seemed to it's it was Darwin's ideas writ large that there could have in deep time been transitional forms mm -hmm. um, between various animal groups mm -hmm. Um, so Sam wants to know, um, do we know of any possible predators of paleo paleogene? Yeah, so these giant spear-billed penguins were living with actually a quite diverse fauna of fish, sharks, um, and marine mammals. And so there were in Eocene like ancestors of sharks like Megalodon were around, members mm -hmm. of the Ototus lineage. Mm -hmm. um, so Megalodon itself appears later in the fossil record, but similar megatooth sharks would have been uh, swimming around there. Right. Um, no Mosasaurus at this time? Mosasaurus unfortunately extinct. Um, but I think the most interesting potential predators of these giant penguins actually would have been, there was a group of what are called the raptorial toothed sperm whales. So the modern That's sperm enough. whale, uh, Physeter, is a incredibly like, highly specialized animal. So it feeds almost exclusively on squid, and it dives into the deep sea to eat squid. Mm -hmm. So most famously, battles with giant squid, but they eat a whole whole variety of cephalopods right, right. down there. Um, so and sperm whales, like they don't have upper teeth; they just have lower teeth, and so they just you know eat soft things. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go back 20 million years or so earlier into the Cenozoic, there's this group of what are called acrophysitorine. Uh, sperm whales, things like Acrophysidor, Brigmophysidor, and then the biggest of them all, the Leviathan, uh, okay, that, that <laughs> had uh, really powerful jaws with massive curved teeth um, that were clearly for macro predation, so not eating soft squid things, but eating right. big vertebrates. Like a so two eating, meter eating long other whales, penguin. eating big sharks, and possibly eating giant penguins. Wow. So. I mean, we don't have any direct fossil evidence of predation on these penguins. Uh, mm -hmm. Their bones, you know, while very common for a fossil bird, are not that common mm -hmm. overall compared to mm -hmm. like fishes and whales and things like that. So I don't know of any, you know, direct feeding traces. So mm -hmm. like uh, bite marks, uh, like claw marks on any of these things. Oh right. Um, okay. But yeah, they yeah. were uh, they were living with a variety of large predatory mammals and fish. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that ties in well to this next question. Okay. So uh, would dinosaurs have met any spear-billed penguins? Well, so the non-avian dinosaurs probably not. So mm -hmm. they probably this group seemingly had not evolved until after the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction, which was sixty-five million years yeah. ago. Yeah. Right. And then. And then so these are these only are like fifty million years ago. Only fifty million years so ago. So there are <laughs> even earlier penguins than this uh, yeah. in the Paleocene. Uh, there's a few, there's like this animal Waimanu from New Zealand mm -hmm. um, that is, and that, but that's, it's already pretty penguiny, but it's a mm -hmm. more primitive animal mm -hmm. in the sense that it's not as well adapted towards life in the water. Mm -hmm. So it seems like penguins really didn't start diversifying until after that extinction. Mm -hmm. And it happened pretty rapidly, um, but there weren't sort of proto penguins living with non avian dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, there were penguin-like flightless aquatic birds that lived with uh, in the Cretaceous though. So there's a group called the Hesperornithids, which were toothed birds, mm -hmm. who were also very big. So Hesperornis can get like six feet long, um, that oh. were flightless uh, and they probably actually would have been, they have very small wing bones and they probably would have been foot propelled divers, more like a grebe or a, some types of duck oh, okay. than so a penguin. Not relying as much on their wings yeah. Relying more on their feet, so they probably might have had like webbed feet, yeah, right? Yeah, so almost certainly the had big webbed water feet. Water away. Okay. Um, and so those live in the in the late Cretaceous, and their bones are mostly found like in Kansas and Nebraska, mm -hmm. and those in the same places where you find mosasaurs, plesiosaurs. Mm -hmm. Those animals probably would have had to watch out for predation from many of those big marine reptiles. Mm -hmm. Um, last question, and I was also very curious about it. We're all on the same wavelength today. Um, well, okay, first, how thick is the ice uh, in the, on Antarctica? Well, I mean, it varies a lot across the surface of the continent. Okay. I mean, you can go, there's anywhere from 
know, towards the edges, only a few meters thick. In densest, it's like a kilometer thick. It's, you know, it's very, there's a whole subglacial lake, Lake Vostok, mm -hmm. that is down hundreds of meters below ice, that there's a big pocket of water down there. Um, wow. Where it's, and it's... I can't even imagine that. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lake buried under a glacier yeah. that no one has ever really seen. Oh, wow. There's ongoing sort of debate among scientists whether it is ethical to, like, drill down into it Cause we uh, never and know. sample. Well, because, you know, there, there could be uh, microorganisms in mm -hmm. there who haven't mm -hmm. had any exposure to the surface in okay. millions of years mm -hmm. and could all be wiped out immediately oh. from human contamination. And we just be like, whoops. Yeah. Um, okay, so speaking of organisms under the ice, uh, if we could go under the kilometer deep Arctic ice, uh, do you think we would find a lot of fossils or even like perfectly preserved animals? Yeah, so in Antarctica, it is, it's a whole continent. It's not, so in the Arctic, the Arctic Sea is covered with uh, glacial, you know, there's, there's some ice up there. Um, but it's an ocean underneath. So the glaciers are on top of places like Baffin Island and Green Greenland and these other mm -hmm. uh, big islands up there. Um, but Antarctica is a proper continent. It's a continental landmass that mm -hmm. just happens to be glaciated. Mm -hmm. And so at, like any continent, it has a lot of sedimentary rock in there. Um, and indeed, in the central trans-Antarctic mountains, uh, Permian through Jurassic rock comes out there that have yielded dinosaur fossils and also the sort of proto-mammal fossils that I like to work on. Mm -hmm. um, so the entirety of Antarctica, you know, other than sort of the igneous portions, you know, probably has fossiliferous rock under there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of the, I guess the only upsides to glacial melt is that more of that will be exposed <laughs> right. in the future. So future paleontologists Yay. get to see a little bit more of the Antarctic fossils. Yeah. Um, have you been to Antarctica for uh, any research? Ne never been to Antarctica. I have done a lot of research on Triassic fossils from there. From there. So those okay. are all housed in museums in the US. Mm -hmm. In collections. Um, in terms of like fully preserved creatures in the ice, like you know frozen mammoths and things, mm -hmm. uh, that is happening already in Siberia and Canada. So as the it's not nice in, in the it's not in ice per se, but in the permafrost, as in this like uh, historically completely frozen uh, surface mm -hmm. of the dirt, basically, uh, as that is thawing out, which it is doing very rapidly now. Uh, people are finding more and more Ice Age mammals. Mm -hmm. So in the past couple of years, I know they found two like wolf pups, like 40,000 years old. They found a, a cave lions mm -hmm. that are several thousand years old. They found yeah. a fossil horse. Uh, whole mammoths and woolly rhino carcasses mm -hmm. are emerging from what was previously frozen dirt, uh, mostly in Siberia, but also sometimes like Alaska, mm -hmm. Yukon area. Mm -hmm. And those will probably continue to come out and be found as uh, you know more stuff melts, and also more people are out looking mm -hmm. um, in some of these previously very remote, uninhabited areas. Right. Um. Oh. Okay. Another question. What would happen if a volcano erupted in Antarctica? Well, uh, it happens all the time. So uh, Antarctica is actively volcanic. Mm -hmm. uh, there are volcanoes there uh, that are just doing their thing. So, um, so are they okay? Elaborate. <laughs> well, I mean, basically every continent on Earth has volcanoes. Okay. So I mean, it's just part of the geological process. Okay. Uh, that you know, anywhere there is there are hot spots in mm -hmm. the mantle where there's or where there are two continental plates going mm -hmm. up against each other, uh, you can get volcanic activity. Does it um, does it melt a lot of the ice? After an so the, the places sometimes it's more like snowpack than ice. The places okay. where there are Antarctic volcanoes are already pretty rocky. Mm -hmm. So it's not they're not like squarely in the middle of the ice shelf okay. melting everything around it. Okay. They're already on the edge of mountain ranges. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that was all the time that we had today, but you guys had some awesome questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, be sure to join us for next month's episode of the Old News Webcast. Um, unfortunately, Christian cannot join us for that one, but we will have a new face for you. We will have a um, paleontologist or a paleontologist in training. Uh -huh. um, yes, that's we'll get. It's yeah, going to be it'll, good. Of course, it'll still be great. Um, and if you ever think of more questions, you can always email us at outreach at naturalsciences.org. And we will see you last Tuesday of the month, next month. Great. Thank you for joining us.
Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> and thank you, of course, for being here. Don't go home. <laughs>